Well, good evening. How are you guys doing? Good. Well, do you know we're continuing our series uh, that's called Pardon Our Dust. And as we're undergoing a church renovation, it reminds us that every one of us are also people under construction. Isn't that right? That God is not finished with us yet, and whether you're sitting here today or tuning in online, that God is still doing work. And um, at least for me, that's a really good thing, that he's still working. Well, speaking of construction, a few years ago, uh, we were remodeling our house, and I was going over some work with an electrician, and he said, uh, do you have any other problems you want me to fix? And I said, well, come to mention it, there's an outlet right over here in this column in the middle of the living room that has never worked. And he said, well, then how do you, how do you vacuum the, the living room? And I said, well, we just, we take the cord, we go down the hall, around the corner, back into the bathroom, up over the vanity, unplug the electric toothbrush, plug it in, and then bring the vacuum out, and we vacuum the whole living room. And then because the cord's not long enough, we get a broom, and we sweep up the little places that we couldn't miss, and we put it away. And then a few minutes later, he's checking out um, another light switch, and he said, well, what is this light switch hook up to? And I said, well, that's another thing that's never worked. We have never been able to figure out what that light switch turned on. And so he gets this little tester, and he plugs it into that electrical outlet, and he goes over and throws the light switch, and what do you think happened? The light went on. And I was thinking for... 10 years, all that time, taking our cord down the hall, around the bathroom, up over the vanity, knocking over my wife's perfume and her hairspray into the sink, plugging it into the thing, vacuuming the whole living room the best we could, sweeping it up what we couldn't, and for 10 years, we had power that we had access to, but we were never, I was never able to tap into that power. For 10 years, all that time, we had all the power available to us, but we never tapped into the power. One little light switch, one little outlet, all that power available to us, and we never tapped in. And I'm here to tell you today that there is more power, power available to you through the Holy Spirit than you ever realized there's more power available to your life through the Holy Spirit than you've ever tapped into. You know, years ago, I learned from my daughter who was working on a science project that our little house is connected to this massive power grid. And that power grid is wired into the mighty Hoover Dam that spins 17 giant turbines that put out 450 uh, 4.5 billion kilowatt hours of power every year, and all that power is connected to our little house, connected to our living room to power my vacuum, and I never knew how to tap into it. And I'm afraid sometimes that's the way we live our lives, that we have all the power we ever need, massive amounts, for anything that comes our way, and we have little or no clue how to tap into that power that God makes available to us. The Apostle Paul said, I pray that out of his glorious riches, God may strengthen you with what? Power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Paul says, I pray out of the glorious riches. Now, what are God's glorious riches? Chris touched on them in the prayer. If we considered all of creation, it would just be the tip of the iceberg. If we considered all the power behind everything that we know about God, his ability to speak things into creation, if we considered every force of nature, the power behind lightning and hurricanes and tornadoes and volcanoes, the power to fuel the sun and all the burning stars, if we considered God's power to create and sustain life, the power to know all things, even to know the number of hairs on our heads, and looking at some of you, that changes probably every day, all right? But how does power like that, all that wisdom, all those resources, God's glorious riches, how does that compare even to an amazing Hoover Dam. 
That's the kind of power that we tap into. And Paul says, I pray that out of his glorious riches, God may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. So if we're not experiencing God's power in our lives, we can be sure it's not a resource problem because God has all the power. It's not a distribution problem because we know the Holy Spirit is in the hearts of all believers. So it must be a connection problem. Somehow we're not tapping in. Somehow we're missing something in the equation. Somehow maybe we, we have a part in it we don't understand. Maybe we underestimate the power available. Maybe we're just so accustomed to powering up on our own and doing things in our own strength that we just never try to tap in to what God offers. Or maybe we just don't believe that God would help us with the kind of power that he has. Well, turn in your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 1. We're going to be looking at a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to Timothy, reminding him of all the power he had available through the Holy Spirit. And I hope it will remind us as well. But before we actually read that text, let me just give you a little context. From a natural perspective, when Paul wrote this letter, his life had cratered. He was in prison again, but this time he wasn't under house arrest with you know, kind of white-collar status. This time he was older. He was at the end of his life. He was in some dark, dank dungeon cell, probably a pit in the ground with a hole in the ceiling just to let some air and light in. He was wearing chains and fetters like a prisoner. He was probably lonely and bored and just hidden away in this hole in the ground. And there would be no escape for Paul from this imprisonment. Nero was burning the city, there he was slaughtering Christians, and Paul knew his days were numbered. And his last day on God's green earth would probably end in the Neronian tradition of cutting his head off if he was lucky, or maybe something way worse. We really don't know how Paul died. So these are the circumstances under which Paul writes this letter to Timothy. And you can imagine for Paul the sense that time is running out, that he needs someone anyone, actually someone that's gifted and called by God to carry on his work as a pastor and an apostle to these churches. For Paul, this was his last chance, his last hope to pass the baton to his heir apparent, Timothy, who he fondly called his son. And in many ways, the progression of the early church would depend upon Timothy taking this baton and embracing the call. But for Timothy, this day was probably coming way too soon for him. He was not ready. He did not feel right about this yet. He had a friend on death row. Jesus had been killed. Christians were being persecuted and fed to lions. And not only that, from other parts of Paul's letters, we learned that that Timothy was struggling personally. He was young and insecure. His health was not great. There was infighting in the church. He might have been struggling with sin. He was doubting his call, doubting he had what it takes. And his fear was disabling, and his fire in his heart was just kind of smoldering down to its last embers. And so with that, we pick it up in 2 Timothy chapter 1, beginning in verse 3. Paul says, I thank God whom I serve as my ancestors did with a clear conscience. As night and day, I constantly remember you and my prayers. Remember, this is a personal letter to Timothy as well as to us. Recalling your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. I'm reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I'm persuaded now lives in you also. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but it gives us power, love, and self-discipline. And so do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or of me, his prisoner. Rather, join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. He has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time, but it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death 
and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. After commenting on how powerful the sincere faith of his mother and grandmother were, just note to moms out there, Paul speaks then to the power and the presence of, Holy, of the Holy Spirit in Timothy's life knowing that the engagement of the Holy Spirit in his heart would be exactly what Timothy would need. And so in verses 6 and 7, Paul refers to the Spirit's work in two contexts. First, how the Holy Spirit empowers specific spiritual gifts that he gives to believers. And in Timothy's case, this was most likely a pastoral leadership gift. And the second thing Paul mentioned is, is he refers to the Holy Spirit's presence and work in all of us. As he says, for the Spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power and love and self-discipline. And Paul knew that if Timothy just engaged the Spirit's power, he'd be fine. Because you see, Paul could relate to Timothy's situation. Years before, when Paul was young in ministry, he faced a huge problem. It was so big, so significant, that he was convinced that if God didn't get rid of it, he'd never be able to accomplish what God had called him to do. Paul referred to this as his thorn in the flesh. He said it was a messenger from Satan. Now, we don't know exactly what the problem was, but it was so debilitating that he prayed earnestly to God for three times that God would just take it away. And Paul had the expectation that God would do exactly that. He would take the problem away, get it out of the way, so Paul would have the strength to do the work, to do the ministry that God had called him to. Paul said, three times I plead with the Lord to take it away from me. But God said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in what? Weakness. And so Paul prays, and at first God is silent. No answers to his passionate prayers. Maybe two days of deeply passionate pleading prayers. I don't know. And then after that, a final increasingly desperate prayer asking for help. And God answers him with a clear no, but also with a promise that God's power would be perfected in Paul's weakness. And then it's almost funny. Paul does kind of an immediate about face and his and says, well, all righty then. Therefore, I'll boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. A better translation is Christ's power may overshadow me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I will delight in my weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. When I am powerless, God always has my back. This moment was a game changer for Paul, realizing that God's power flows more perfectly and efficiently through our weaknesses when we surrender and trust and say, I can't do this my, on my own. And God is eager to flow power into our lives. There's a great peace knowing that when we hit our limits, the battle belongs to the Lord. When we can do nothing to change our circumstances, we can be confident that God is at work most powerfully, sometimes to alter our circumstances, but most often to change us, to equip us, to help us by strengthening us as we trust in him. So the first thing we learn about accessing more power from God is that God's power is made perfect in weakness. Paul says, for when I am weak, then I will be strong. When I'm powerless, I can trust that God has my back. You know, for me, there's been times where I've just been kind of white-knuckling it through life. Situations where I felt like I was at the end of my rope, I was out of options. Sometimes I have been debilitated by fear, seeing no good or no way through feeling sad or hurt or frustrated or angry and just felt powerless. And honestly, not seeing God move in any ways that I wanted him to. And over the years, my typical prayers were in those situations, just like Paul's with his thorn. I'd say, God, fix this. 
God, take it away. God, would you change this? Would you make it stop? God, just do what I'm asking you to do. Please, it will obviously be better. Just try it my way, God. Please, oh, just this once, come on, God. Has anybody ever prayed like that? Is that just me? Ever felt that way? These moments can be so hard, and, and I'm sorry if some of you are going through that right now. I actually prayed for you when I was preparing this message. But I can tell you in hindsight, with past struggles, so often it was to God's glory not to do it my way, the way I was requesting even as he might allow me to go right up to the edge of a cliff, even when I was actually falling over the edge, I found those desperate moments of weakness. I found this amazing God who is always there to catch us and hold us, who is always faithful. But as Christians, we also know, and here's the disclaimer, we are not our own. We've been bought with a price. And because God has called us and saved us and has plans for us and purposes that he's prepared in advance for us to do, and because God disciplines those he loves to make us stronger and better, we can be assured we will have ample opportunities to see if God's power will come through in weaknesses. To endure, as Paul mentioned, weaknesses and insults, hardships, persecutions, and difficulties. All these are opportunities for God's power to be perfected in our lives. But Paul continued to rejoice up until his last day, certainly not having all the outcomes he wanted in his life and the ones he would have preferred, but, um, but he got intimacy with God, just like we can. He got the power to overcome, the power to endure, the power to grow, the power to fulfill God's purposes, which were much greater and grander than his, and to experience the joy and peace that surpasses all human understanding when life looks its worst. So what, did you think this was a message about seeing God as a genie in the bottle and you just rub him for three wishes and you get that kind of power? No, this is the great adventure of faith. God preparing us for eternity and making us the best we can be. It's like when Stephen Jobs was trying to convince John Scully, who was the chairman of PepsiCo, to come work for Apple Computer. And he said, John, you need to decide. Do you want to make sugar water the rest of your life or do you want to change the world? And what God offers us is the power to be world changers. As he changes us, this great adventure of faith. Well, the second way to access more of the power of God is to fan into flame the gift of God. This is where we play a vital part in unleashing the power of God. I'm sure we've all seen people who have made fire by hand whether you've seen it in real life or you've seen it on TV on a survival show or maybe you were in the Boy Scouts or the Girl Scouts, but you know how it goes. Somebody gets this real dry little kindling and they make a little wad of it and it's really highly flammable leaves or, or kindling or whatever. And then they get kind of a, a piece of wood or bark and, and then a stick and then they start rubbing it with their hands, right? And you know, because you've seen this before, they're rubbing it as fast as they can and they're totally focused on it and they're just looking for that, that moment where there's going to be a little bit of, a, of, a little bit of smoke and, and see a little bit of heat and, and something going. And as soon as it starts going, as soon as it starts getting hot, <clears throat> they throw a little bit of that kindling on there and they're rubbing it and all of a sudden you, it starts to just smoke a little bit and what do they do? They start blowing it. <sighs> they might fan it a little bit. And the flame gets going, and then what happens when it bursts into flame? What does everybody who starts fire, what do they do? They go, I did it! I've got fire! They look kind of like this. (laughs) They get so excited when they're able to start fire. 
And now it's one thing if we're doing that on a Boy Scout camping trip or in the Girl Scouts or we're just doing it for fun, but in some situations, fire is life. If you're like the early settlers crossing a snowy pass, fire may keep you from freezing to death. Fire may help you prepare your food. In fact, fire was so precious to some people in those times and in some situations that they would do whatever it takes to keep that little ember glowing. In fact, they would take a little ember out of the fire and they would wrap it up in some kindling and then get some kind of wet moss that would make it kind of a little cocoon. They'd treat this thing like a baby as they would put it in maybe a saddlebag or a horse because they knew if this fire goes out when we're crossing the snowy pass, we are going to die. And they would take such care of this little fire, this little spark, so it would not go out. Why? Because spark, the spark was life. It would save their lives. The spark had the power of life. And so as the Holy Spirit comes into our life, it's not like a roaring fire where he comes in and he just takes over and he burns away all our problems or he he lets all our opportunities, you know, fire up for success. He comes to life, to our lives, as a little spark, as a gentleman in our hearts. He doesn't take over and thwart our free will. The Spirit is there to help us, to serve us, to meet our needs, to intercede. But He requires us to engage with Him, to relate with Him, to nurture the relationship and fan into flame and work together. And what Paul is referring to for Timothy is to work the coals, stir them up, add effort, add some fuel to your life, add some fuel to your faith. Let's get these coals going. Let's get this gift that God gave you to be a leader in the church, to take the gospel out, to carry on this this calling that I had that I'm going to die and stir it up. The powers within, you do not have to be afraid. Use this spiritual gift. And you know, for all of us believers, we all have a spiritual gift or gifts given to us by God. And the reason is that we would use them. So do you want more power in your life? Do what Paul said in the book of Romans. He said, if you have the gift of teaching, teach. If you have the gift of serving, serve. If you have the gift of encouragement, encourage someone. If you have the gift of giving, give generously. If you have the gift of leading, do it diligently or mercy, do it cheerfully. He's saying, use it. Stir it up. I was very convicted by this passage because there's, as I observe some of the gifts or a gift in my life, I'm going, I am not really stirring it up. I'm not using it. And by definition, spiritual gifts are empowered by the Holy Spirit. They're very different than natural talents and gifts and abilities that we have from this world. And so church, this is a call to action to use our spiritual gifts. Sometimes people think, well, I'm an accountant, so maybe I can serve in the administration department. Or I lead a business, so maybe I can be a leader of a team. I don't know. Sometimes spiritual gifts are the opposite. The CEO has a spiritual gift of teaching Sunday school, but we only know if it's a spiritual gift, if it's empowered by the Holy Spirit and revealed by God as your calling. And for me, it's usually understood when I go, I feel so inadequate, so insecure, so afraid, just like Timothy, there's no way I can do it. That gives me a clue that it might be part of a spiritual gift or a special calling. The Spirit of God is ready to give you power. Maybe all that's holding you back is you're not stepping into it, testing it, talking into God, praying about it, looking at His Word and fanning it into flame. Well, finally, the third way to access God's power is to receive the power through the Holy Spirit within you. 
Paul said, for the gift God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. Try to think about any problem or any need you have that would not be helped by supernatural power and love and self-discipline. If you're like me, you need God's power and love and self-control or self-discipline because you cannot pull these up in the doses that you need for some of the things you face in life. I do not have the strength and the power and the wisdom and the energy or the capacity to address all the problems I face or the opportunities that God brings. I don't have it. I do not have within me all the love that is required to be the kind of husband or father or even the pastor or neighbor or friend that I want to be. I do not have within my natural self the ability to be self-disciplined enough to even manage myself or lead in the church or in my home or manage my own soul without some supernatural help. I don't know about you. Does anybody need some supernatural power in their lives today? Paul said, I pray that out of his glorious riches, he will strengthen you with what? Say it with me, power through his spirit in your inner being. This word power is my new favorite word in the Bible because it comes from the word dunamis, which means dynamite. It's where we get our word dynamite. This kind of power is explosive power. It's strong power. It's rocket engine power. It's miracle working power. It's the kind of power, it's like fireworks power, and I say that because you'll think about this message on Monday. But Duno's power is not like human power. It's supernatural. It's a gift from God to you and me, and it comes from only one place, his glorious riches through the Holy Spirit into our inner beings. Anybody need some of God's dunamis, supernatural power in your life today? You must know, you cannot buy this kind of power. You cannot manufacture it. You cannot bankroll it. You cannot pull it from within. You cannot get this power from other people. No amount of hard work, no amount of experience or wealth or high position in the org charts of life will give you this kind of power. There is only one way to get it, and that is to receive it as a miraculous gift from God, flowing out of his glorious riches, waiting for you to tap in, readily available only through the Holy Spirit in your inner being. The power's on.